Buildings are the new streets. Uh, it will be presented by Daniel Schorlemel and Felix de Latre. So uh, let me give you a brief presentation from them. So they are coming from the science community, and they will be speaking about the use of open street map, especially the buildings in it. So discussing with Felix a bit earlier uh, the presentation, before we used to be um, at the beginning mapping uh, streets, that was kind of the most important thing. And now uh, it has becoming buildings, the new thing that is really important in OSM. So Felix and Daniel will explain a bit further regarding uh, this topic. Daniel is seismologist and Felix is information technologist and they are working in the German Research Center of Geoscience. So let's welcome them uh, for the talk buildings are the new Hello, and welcome to our talk about buildings in OpenStreetMap. I'm Daniel, and I'm working at GFZ, the German Research Center for Geosciences. Within the section of seismic hazard and risk dynamics, I'm leading a group working on a global dynamic building model with a focus on earthquake risk. Hey, I'm Felix, and I'm part of Daniel's team. For our work, we fundamentally rely on OpenStreetMap. We use and process its building data for a new approach in our research. If you're interested in this topic, please make sure that you attend Daniel's talk tomorrow about earthquakes and OpenStreetMap. In this presentation, we will be talking about global building datasets, what is so special about them, and how OpenStreetMap plays an important role. Why is an open database with all kind of geographic data called OpenStreetMap? The name already suggests that in the beginning it was primarily about orientation and movement. No wonder, because in the first decade of the 2000s, when OpenStreetMap was initially built, computer-supported routing was the new innovation. Digital maps were mainly focused on roads and contained only landmarks or very important buildings. Back then, they started with applications based on routing. First, car navigation systems started to replace the big stacks of paper maps and traveling. Then, with the rising distributions of smartphones, personal map apps that provided digital maps and navigation aids became available to everyone. Also, analysis of movement, traffic, public transportation, accessibility to jobs and leisure, etc. started being recorded and assessed by researchers and development agencies. And the data has been used early on for disaster response, again with a focus on roads and maybe bridges to understand which of them became impassable. The level of road coverage in OpenStreetMap was growing rapidly, not only due to dedicated mappers who used GPS devices to map their surroundings and remote locations using satellite imagery. Small-scale activities were accompanied by large-scale data imports, most notably the Tiger data in the United States, which provided a complete set of roads, even if they were of relatively low accuracy. Other countries followed this example, and in most regions of the world, we can consider now the coverage of public roads to be relatively complete. Of course, it was welcome from the beginning to map more than just streets and roads in OpenStreetMap. However, in the area of buildings, mostly prominent buildings or important buildings such as train stations, airports, town halls, hospitals, etc. were mapped. The mapping of points of interest and addresses, which in turn are useful for navigation point of view, was the next step before the complete mapping of buildings became more and more popular in the last 10 years. Buildings are increasingly coming into focus. They represent the location of people, they are representatives of economic development and activities, and they help to understand the economic status, movement patterns, and distributions of people. Humanitarian organizations such as Doctors Without Borders use building data not only to plan how to get to people, but also how many people are likely to live in which part of the country and in which settlement to ensure that they distribute well 
medicines and vaccines. Similarly, the distributions of buildings is important for understanding the potential impact of natural hazards on people and values. Rough but globally homogeneous estimates were made possible by global coverage with satellite images and processing techniques to detect the signature of buildings or build-up areas. Global but also very general data sets on population distribution and distribution of build-up area were produced. Although they are rather inaccurate approximation of the distribution of buildings, they have proven to be very useful in many applications. I would like to highlight two datasets for global building coverage. The first is the Global Human Settlement Layer, which is funded by the European Commission. It was created by automatic classification of satellite images and is currently renewed every five years. The second is the High Resolution Settlement Layer, which was created by Columbia University together with Facebook. They used a combination of computer vision techniques to classify blocks of optical satellite data of the entire planet, whether or not it is populated, which means it contains buildings. And then they enriched it with census data to assign population shares to settlement areas. Recently, there have been remarkable advances in the automatic recognition of map features from satellite or drone images based on processing of statistical models, which is often referred to as machine learning or artificial intelligence. Using complex calculations, it is now possible to produce actual building footprint estimates for entire countries. For example, last year I was involved in a project with Microsoft and the humanitarian OpenStreetMap team, and we created open datasets for Uganda and Tanzania. And I'm sure it's only a matter of time before global datasets of building footprint predictions are conducted and hopefully made available to the public. There are already several companies working on this. Luckily, we do not need to rely on big companies to produce building data. This video shows the development of building data in OpenStreetMap for the city of Berlin. The video moves forward in five day increments. And within each of these five days, any building that has been added or changed is lighting up. You can clearly see how everything started with adding landmark buildings and then activities of volunteers in their neighborhood, moving everything into the downtown area, from there into the suburbs, and then finally trying to complete the building data set of the city. And in the later days, you can only see how single buildings and various points of the city have been updated just to keep the data as fresh and new as possible. Nowadays, many projects and many more volunteers are actively working on mapping buildings in OpenStreetMap. The number of buildings has reached almost 400 million and is growing at a staggering rate of about 150,000 per day, or actually two per second. So, something special is happening here. OSM is becoming the most verified global data set for buildings. Until now, building footprints have been either used very locally or in aggregated form and globally. But now it's time to take the precision of local analysis to a global level, and OSM is the key. It offers the great value of responsibly incorporating human mapping and open data sets and having them checked for quality and legal approval by the critical community itself. This is a potential quantum leap for many applications that previously worked with very general data aggregates, such as the aforementioned settlement layers. And more importantly, it opens the door for many more new applications of building data in the future. In OpenStreetMap, there is an obvious interest in buildings that has grown in recent years. The ability to render 3D buildings from OSM began to make it interesting to describe buildings in more detail. I believe we'll see more and more motivation to add more detail to buildings as we map them in OpenStreetMap. Within our research group, we are working exactly on the edge of aggregated data being the state of the art, and we improved these methods significantly by using OpenStreetMap's global building data. We process the data and then conduct our research on top of it. We see this huge potential for all kinds of topics and want to offer our work to the public to use and eventually to team up with us. Therefore, we are creating the open building map. It can be considered a window to OpenStreetMap, a building-focused version of OSM. It consumes continuously data from OSM, cleans it up, processes additional building attributes, 
and makes the resulting data set available as open data exports and web maps to inspect building information. In the open building map, we are cleaning up and consolidating some OSM tags in order to make the data set consistent. For example, we estimate the number of stories from the building height in meters, or we fix typos in the tags to make the data more useful. Or we look into building types and their usage. This is not always the same. Think about a church building that is nowadays partially used for housing. In OSM, there are several approaches to tagging this, and by analyzing the data, we try to catch different concepts, apply them to attributes that are on clear data structure. And then we do additional calculations. These are heavy and might take over a year with a decent server to calculate. We add them to the buildings and make them available. We define the position of a house in relation to neighbor houses. We calculate the size of the ground area of each and every building. In the second step, we calculate the floor space, which is generally speaking, the building footprint's ground area multiplied by the levels. Based on more complex rules among several OSM tags, we attempt to define the occupancy following the standard building taxonomy. For our calculations, we assume a grid of the world. And to prefer more complex calculations, which are enhanced by the details derived from the building data in OpenStreetMap, it is useful for us to understand the degree of completeness in OpenStreetMap. It's perfectly okay if these data are estimates, but we're interested in worldwide coverage. We use a combination of two different main sources and approaches. As a general fallback for the world, coverage of build-up areas with remote sensing techniques in comparison with OSM data. For this purpose, the global data sets already mentioned can be used for global population estimation. In addition, we are experimenting with the classical remote sensing techniques with open radar data from Sentinel-1 and combine them with the machine learning prediction data set from Facebook Roads. There's nothing better than the human eye, but going through all the many, many tiles just to get started is a lot of work. However, for regional areas of interest where we want to improve the quality of our calculations, we are working with MapSwipe to obtain from people, mainly us, a sense of completeness when viewing satellite images and OSM data. Our software stack has become what it is over time, and we are happy to take a step back now. We want to reconsider the implementations, we want to clean up everything and then release it as free software. We want to make this a collaborative process and invite everyone to take a look at our repository. In the upcoming weeks and months, we will release the various components there. Besides the building database, the system is a tile-based geographic information system. And all our grid calculations are actually based on tiles, which we index then with a quad tree. The calculation engines will be based on generic processing pipelines, which might be interesting for more people doing extensive calculations on global datasets, especially around OpenStreetMap. The implementation is done with asynchronous Python, we use async.io, and WebSockets to communicate the processing state to connected software components. Last but not least, we are redesigning our website to offer building data extracts for download and to make the web map fun and fast to load by using vector tiles instead of heavy raster tile layers. We are pleased to move to an open source code and data principle within our research institute. According to the maxim, public money, public code. We want to contribute something useful to OpenStreetMap and we are looking for collaboration on code, data and knowledge. Please pay attention to our website and code repositories in the coming months. If you like, you can follow us in the Fediverse. This is the cool and free Twitter alternative. And there you get all the small updates on our project and you can get in touch with us. And of course, please contact us if you have questions, comments, ideas, or suggestions. We hope to see you all in person on next year's State of the Map. Thanks again, and bye-bye. Thank you, Felix. Thank you, Daniel, for the presentation. It was really interesting how you are showing the importance of having buildings also in OSM and how everybody can take advantage of this data available right there. So we have many questions. I'm super happy to uh, start with this. So do you have any comments before we start with the uh, questions, Felix or Daniel? No, I guess you can just shoot with the questions. We're ready. Okay, perfect.
All right. So let me look to this screen right here so I can read the path. Okay. Uh, first question is, if you had to make a prediction, when do you think building data will be mostly mapped? One year, two years, or more? That's the first question we have. Okay. Uh, that's a difficult one. Uh, first of all, we don't know how many buildings there are on Earth. Uh, from the extrapolation in countries that are more or less completely mapped, we see roughly a factor of four um, between the buildings and the number of people living in the country, which would hint to something up to 2 billion buildings on Earth. Currently, we have 400 million. And um, as we said in the talk, we're getting about 150,000 a day. I still think we're many, many years away from that goal. So one or two years will certainly not make it if it's, you know, mapping by hand. If there are large scale imports, it could, of course, uh, speed the process up. But I would not think that within the next five years we will ever reach this point. Yeah. Sure. All right. Felix, anything you want to add? No, I'm taking the next question. <laughs> okay, good. So uh, next question is, uh, have you considered this week's release of UK government uh, IDs, uh, the, the name is, I think is UPRNs for every property as open data. Yeah, I think I would like to take this question more towards the direction of like generally importing or combining open data sets with, with OpenStreetMap data. And so far, our goal is to get things into OpenStreetMap and then consume it instead of finally mixing different data sets, if they're open or not. Um, why? Because we appreciate OpenStreetMap. We think that OpenStreetMap does an excellent job on verifying, on building the best data out there. So why should we try to um, to come to, yeah, to mix them in later on? So the short answer is, in particular to this data set, let's get this into OpenStreetMap, it makes sense, and then it will be also in the open building. Map. Okay, thank you, Felix. So our next question is, could you talk a bit more on how you estimate building occupancy from the data? Yeah, okay. Um, we are um, making basically a three-step approach. The first one is uh, we check what land use the building is um, located in. This is sort of our very basic uh, assumption. If we have no further information, we will take that one. Then we look into the building tag. So it could be building apartments, building train station, building hotel, building church or something. That overrides, of course, the land use tag. And then we're looking into POIs, say shops, doctoral offices, restaurants, coffee shops, etc., that are located within that building. And from that, based on um, you know local knowledge, which is codified and rules, uh, we estimate or give a best guess of the occupancy type of a particular building. Okay, thank you, Daniel. So next question is, uh, privacy is a concern of many. Have you considered this? Is there a way for people to say, I don't want my building listed, uh, or a way to say, let's use but, uh, an anonymized seat? Yeah, um, I think that we are taking here the luxury position that we say this is something we have to deal out in the community of OpenStreetMap. We are not taking any different approach to this. Um, we definitely, we, we have like concerns or questions for ourselves, like the more we add data to buildings and especially guests data, whether it makes sense to republish this or better to hold it um, for only our researchers. Um, but in principle, it's really the question towards to, to for the community, for the OpenStreetMap community. How, like, I would like to give it back to everyone here um, in the room, in the virtual room, to say, hey, uh, how do we do? How do we deal with buildings that people are in general think people don't want to be mapped, but they are on OpenStreetMap? Yeah, and I, I think there's a comment from someone else in the in the chat. Uh, this person is saying, but they are some satellite data, so there is no personal data. So it's a comment, I think, regarding this question they put it in the path. So next question is uh, from Indy Bio. Uh, he, uh, this person said, I am interested in metadata, energy use, water use, water harvest, or green energy potential from roof area. When does this become a privacy issue? I don't know, but this is a feedback I have received before. 
Can you repeat the, the first part of the question? Yes, sir. Uh, if it's not clear, we can ask this person uh, to uh, elaborate more and we can come back later. So I will repeat it right now. And if it is not clear, we can uh, come back. It says, I am interested in metadata, energy use, water use, water harvest, or green energy potential from roof area. When does this become a privacy issue? I don't know, but this is a feedback I have received before. Oh, okay. Well, that, that goes, yeah, definitely way beyond of what we're doing. Um, uh, for what for our purpose, we're looking uh, only under like, what is the roof shape? And we try to uh, understand what type of building we actually have, but we are not making any estimates of, you know, what would be the sort of the energy content that could be collected to such a roof. This, of course, if you compute this, become a privacy issue mm -hmm. um, but then i go back to exactly what felix said that's something that's a broader discussion that goes definitely beyond what we're doing that doesn't community decision are we allowed to map something like this or should we be doing it okay thank you daniel for the answer so the next question will be uh what do you consider a building for example are temporary makeshift informal settlements or buildings under construction uh, consider a building? Uh, currently, we, we orientate this at the, along the building tag itself. So mm -hmm. the major um, data we collect or actually process are the polygons um, that contain the building tag. But we are, of course, also looking for some other purposes. That's my talk tomorrow about the earthquake stuff, also into bridges and other things. But a building is what is tagged as a building equals something in OpenStreetMap. Maybe I can just quickly add to this because I think the question was also about like what could potentially be a building. And for our work, it is not it doesn't matter so much because we are complementing um, the like the incomplete OSM building data with. Um, like the other calculations we are doing that Daniel is going to talk about. So we, we are not considering that the data set is perfect. So we are flexible anyway. So we are we are definitely doing calculations that are approximations to something. And this is why we can comfortably say we, we just rely on OpenStreetMaps criteria for buildings. Okay, perfect. Thank you, uh, Felix, also for uh, complementing the answer. So the next question will be, uh, what was the thinking behind hosting your code uh, in Debian Salsa? Uh, is it Debian related? Um, so another comment is great to see people using it. Yeah, I'm happy to take this question actually. Um, <laughs> I so, uh, <laughs> so no, I think we wanted to host on Git. Um, GitHub and GitLab were no options for us because we have colleagues in Iran, we have friends in Cuba and they cannot access. We think that those platforms are not really suitable for collaboration. Um, so we looked into what are like open and free alternatives that are really inclusive for everybody. And there are not so many, unfortunately. And um, and salsa.debian.org is an established community, so we can have collaboration. It is open source, it is reliable, and it's not blocked by any countries that are not liked so much by other countries. So it's just open. Um, it, the code that we are doing is not strictly Debian related and salsa.debian.org says actually every code is welcome, which could potentially end up in Debian. So it must be open source, which is our code. And um, yeah, it was the best platform we could find to actually have collaboration in a really open environment. Yeah, and um, of course we were really looking for a platform that is um, sharing our ethical principles in this and GitHub and GitLab are not. Yeah, great right to hear that, uh, Daniel and Felix. Uh, so the next question I have is, um, hold on one second. Uh, yeah, you say that you detect tagging errors. Have you thought about giving this back to mappers so they can fix it? Um, yeah, we, we are thinking about this and how to do this best. But there's, of course, um, often a, a conflict if we say, okay, we will change this tag into something because we make an interpretation of a building, then maybe the mapper or even a very local community may not be happy about this because their specific tag uh, may indicate something that 
on their level is very important, but on a global scale, as we operate, is not so important, and we better, you know, unify these things. Um, so that's why we don't do this uh, uh, in writing it back and overriding other people's tags. The other thing is the um, uh, the typos. That's something um, I think we should actually start a discussion if particular typos that are very common should just automatically be changed, whether through a JOSM plugin or on the server side, where there's an agreed list of uh, what should be changed so that uh, the data set just uh, has a higher quality at the end. But, uh, you know, unless this is already implemented somewhere, we have to do it ourselves, but we're not trying to override other people's data. That's why we keep this change for us. Okay. I think one, one thing to add here um, too is um, a lot of the building information that has been mapped in OpenStreetMap started when there was a visualization of it. So when 3D buildings came out, like a possibility to render them, um, people started actually putting like heights on buildings because they could see it. Um, on our website, openbuildingmap.org, you can actually look at the different um, data that we produce and you can inspect it and we um, hope that like looking at this data being able to visualize it motivates people to add more information and to fix information of course mm -hmm. and increase the quality okay uh, there is one comment i'm not sure if it's from the person who did the question or someone else because there is no names here uh it says uh you can give back the errors not the fixes yeah that's a good point yeah. um thanks yeah. Okay. I'm processing 400 million buildings, and it's difficult to <laughs> send the arrows back to the single mapper. Yeah, I can imagine that. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Maybe there is a good way to do this. Yeah. I mean, let's see if more people want to participate uh, in supporting the project. I mean, why not? I mean, maybe they, they can they can see what can be done regarding this, this topic. Uh, yeah. The next question I have uh, is, uh, Canada was trying to map all uh, its building in OSM by 2020. Do you know if this was achieved or it will be finished uh, in the year? Canada. Yeah. I don't know anything about this. Sorry. OK. All right. So OK, we don't have the answer. Uh, maybe someone else in the community uh, can add something to the path if they know the answer. So um, what else? OK, I think that's the last question I have right now. I have a couple comments I can read, and then we should move forward to the next uh, presentation, too. So one of the comments is, expect big resistance. Many buildings in certain countries are actually illegal according to local laws, so will be quite embarrassing. That's one of the comments we have. Um, the next comment uh, is uh, two links, can.github.io. Uh, uh, slash factory underscore data. Uh, these are examples of OSM-based illegal building reporting sites for Taiwan. But even the government uh, compares satellite changes to no result. So that's also one comment, no question here. And the last one is, uh, glad you are putting buildings in the right place. I hope, they said in parentheses. Uh, for me, doing it by hand in ID. The offsets due to misaligned imagery are many meters. Um, so that's one of the comments too. And somebody else uh, complement the comments saying, which one only finds out years later? We ID mappers just can't tell which imagery is correct, being Maxar, et cetera, flip a coin. The comment comes from Taiwan. Okay, I think uh, that's, that's it for the talk. Uh, those are the questions and the comments we received. Thanks a lot for your time. Thanks a lot for your talk. It was really interesting to see how OSM has been changing over the years and now uh, building is the new, new goal for OSM. So thanks a lot for your presentation, Felix and Daniel. And see you around in the next presentations. Take care and.